This morning I'll be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will def- depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the, through the insincerity of liars whose cons- consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. A uh, recent survey just within the past few months came out and reported that um, that while 90 percent, this is by Pew Research Group, they do a lot of researching on the religious sentiment in our country. And in 1990, 90 percent of people, and that would include adults and younger adults, um, would affiliate with Christian faith. So they would say that they were part of the Christian faith. In 2020, a survey was done that says 64 percent would affiliate with the Christian faith. Uh, increased were atheists, agnostics, and then the, the nuns, the, those that don't affiliate with any sort of faith. And they, they think if you extrapolate that over the years, that those who identify as Christians would be a minority by 2045, so in less than 25 years. Uh, That's at least the trajectory of it. Now, when you hear those statistics, assuming they're accurate or somewhat accurate, does that scare you? Does it cause you? Or does your blood kind of boil and you think, I got to get prayer back in the schools? What what do you think when you hear those things? Is it new to us? Is it remarkable in our time? You you, You see, Paul is confronted with the same situation. This idea of apostasy or departing from the faith, turning, deconversion, whatever you like to call it. I mean, interesting though, last week we talked about the church. I mean, the glory of the church, right? It's a hidden glory. It's the household of God, the church of the living God. It's called the pillar and buttress of truth. And then Paul slides right into the world in which the church is planted. So the church may be these things. And the church may be full of this hidden glory, and yet it exists in a world that is antagonistic, that is opposed to it. I mean, this is the second time Paul has taught about false teachers. He's going to do it one more time in chapter 6. But clearly, it's something that he faced. It's something that we face. So how do we face you know, these kind of strong headwinds that we feel? How do, we, how do we face it as the pillar and buttress of truth? Well, two ways I'd give you. I think that the text reminds us. Uh, number one is just to discern the deception. Where is the deception? What does lead us away from active faith in Christ? And then secondly, to delight in God. Uh, kind of a funny way to confront this kind of heresy is we just get happy. We're happy in God. We're happy in all that God has given to us, reminding us of his goodness and power and beauty. So kind of a simple two-part sermon. First, the deception. Look with me back at one to three. Paul wants the church to be able to diagnose, to discern where is false teaching? Where does it come from? What is it? What's the content? So one to three. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So here we're introduced again to the spirit. Remember last week, uh, the spirit was given to validate the work of Jesus in the resurrection. So by the resurrection, we could see that Jesus is the Son of God. His claims to be the Messiah are true, that all the promises of eternal life are certain. And we see that by the validation of the Spirit. But now the Spirit, it says, warns expressly that some are going to depart from the faith. They're going to, that Greek word is apostatize. They're going to, they're going to wander away from the faith. Now, it expressly says, how how is that working? Well, we don't know for sure. It could have been when Jesus was inspired by the Spirit in Matthew 24, 
when he said that in those later days, people will depart from the faith. It could have been Paul, right? Paul, inspired by the Spirit, when he was speaking to the Ephesian elders in chapter 20. Remember these words? He says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. So it could have been that. But Paul simply warns that the Spirit has prepared the church to know that in these latter times, some will depart. But notice in these later times, look at that with me, because we, the later times or the last days or the end times or the end days, it's all the same word. It isn't the month before Jesus returns. When he says that they'll depart in later times, That word later times is really is an expression of a time period. So from the ascension of Jesus to the return of Jesus, those are the later times. It's not the month before Christ returns. The later times are also called the church age. It's the age Paul existed in. It's the age we are currently existing in. So it's in these times that people are going to profess a faith, but then recant. They're going to join a church, but then they're going to leave. That in these later times, in this church age, uh, people will come and make statement of faith, but will not finish it out. But they don't do this in a vacuum. You see that there are false teachers. Notice he says uh, that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves, or it says that they'll through these through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared and who forbid marriage and require absence. In other words, these people who will depart, these false professors, they will be helped along by false teachers. These false teachers, uh, Paul says, that are insincere, they're hypocritical, their consciences are seared. They have promoted, they once knew the truth, but now they don't know the truth. And they've been so busy promoting a falsehood that they have begun to believe that falsehood. And therefore, they don't even know that they're preaching a falsehood. That's what I think he means by their consciences are seared or even branded. Uh, But notice the content of their teaching that they forbid marriage and they forbid certain foods. Now, what, what's going on here? Well, I think simply put, this is kind of what we call a, a pre-Gnosticism. Gnosticism as a way of thought would come later. Uh, but pre-Gnosticism, this idea that it looks at matter, it looks at the physicality of our world as evil, you know, eating, marrying, The physical pleasures is part of an old order. Now that Jesus has come and now that the new kingdom has come, it's it's better to attain the spirit world to aim for something higher, more glorious. And and so it's this this kind of, um, it's this negating of the physical pleasures of life. We call it asceticism today. Asceticism is just renouncing all physical pleasures. This idea of saying no to marriage and and no to food and to move away from the things that are part of an old order. Now, notice that these false teachers aren't making this upon their own. Paul sources it in the sense that he says it comes from deceitful spirits and and the teachings of demons. Let that shock you. I mean, Paul sees that this teaching, denying the goodness of God, denying the goodness of God's creation is from the pit of hell, is what he's saying. And I think the reason he says that is because it was the same temptation in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. You know, when, when Satan approached the man and the woman and he said, did God really say that? He really doesn't want you to eat from this tree? He, he says, you'll surely not die. He says, no, 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 your eyes will be opened and then you'll know good and evil, just like him. You'll have the knowledge of good and evil. And and so do you see what Satan was doing in the very garden? He was first promoting this idea of the goodness of God really is to be doubted and it's to be questioned. He really doesn't have your good in his mind. And and Satan also distorted the word. He also changed the word. And that's what these false teachers are doing here. They're questioning the goodness of God. God is good and he's created. Everything he's created is good, but you can't have that. It's not good now. Do you see they're saying what God determined good, they're saying is evil. 
So you see it kind of come out of the garden. That's why he says it has demonic origin. So simply this, there will be false professors who are led along by false teachers, and they will be giving a false teaching, denying the things that God has made as good, saying that they're evil. So what do we take away from this? How do you and I walk away from this text? Well, well, number one, I would say just as a takeaway, just as an application, number one would be don't be surprised at deconversions. Don't be surprised when people turn away. They may drift away being distracted. They may deliberately walk away because they think they have a better idea at explaining the meaning of life and the purpose of life. I mean, don't be, Jesus said that some seed will fall among good soil and others on rocky soil and soil with thorns. And the test, the proof of the pudding is in time. Those crops that sprang up did not last. Uh, Peter says the same thing. Jude says the same thing. Paul is saying it here. We shouldn't be surprised. There will be people that make a profession. We have these celebrity deconversions now. They get all the attention, but, but it's more than that. There will be people who come and say they believe and ultimately walk away for a myriad of reasons. Now, to say that we shouldn't be shocked doesn't mean we shouldn't be saddened. I, I mean, this is, to me, it's an eternal error. It's something that should, should really move us to want to pray, even plead with people to consider the truth as they once knew. So we don't want to be shocked. This is, this is also why we delay baptism for those who are younger. We want to make sure that the seeds are planted and, and it's beginning to grow. The Puritans, even back in the 18th century, they would wait three years for even adults who were converted to make sure and not give a false assurance of faith. Until the, until the Christian had been tested and proven, and then they baptize. So, so let's not be shocked. Secondly, let's not be blind. Don't be blind to the darkness associated with false teaching. I think we're, we're almost uncomfortable to talk about Satan anymore. We're so secularized that to talk about Satan almost feels like we're talking about a boogeyman. And, and who believes in the boogeyman? Nobody does. Uh, we, we tend to do two errors with Satan. We tend to overemphasize him or underemphasize him. Now, when we overemphasize him, this is when we make Satan responsible for everything. And everything bad and evil is related to him, and he's done it all. The problem is that just creates a new dualism. It, it kind of sets up this, this kingdom of darkness and kingdom of light, and they're, they're kind of in this Greco-Roman wrestling match where no one ultimately wins. It's like the Star Wars. It's a new dualism, two powers fighting each other. It's an over, and the problem with us overemphasizing Satan is it somehow gets us out of being responsible. You see, these false teachers are responsible. They're hypocritical. They're lying. Their consciences are seared. So Paul doesn't mind calling them to task. But at the same time, particularly in the Western world, the, the error tends to be that we, we don't think about darkness as being at the root of these things. We, we don't worry deeply about these things. We, we kind of don't, we, we kind of envisioned him as kind of a, you know, the pitchfork and the pointy tail, and we kind of write him off as no threat at all. But let me remind you what Paul said. And he said this to the Ephesian church. He says, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and forces in dark places. Now, what's Paul saying there? He's saying that our battle in terms of the faith, the struggle that we have, there is darkness associated with it. Or Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 10, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So if, if this talk of darkness kind of makes you feel awkward, then try to figure out the New Testament without it. He exists in power. Jesus told Peter, he's like a lion seeking whom he can devour. So the stakes are real and the stakes are, are high. So let's not be blind to the reality of this in terms of false teaching. And then don't be allured, thirdly, don't be allured uh, by external religion as these false teachers were. 
Yeah, that's what it, external religion is the prohibition of things. That's what we have in our text. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. Now listen, there is a place in Scripture where we deny ourselves, right? We just did it last weekend when we fasted as a church. We denied ourselves food so as to remind ourselves of our creatureliness. Uh, there are some people who deny themselves marriage because they want to serve God with the fullness of their lives. I don't think he's speaking about that. I think he's speaking about the teaching that promotes you can't do this and you can't do that as a means of finding acceptance with God. You know, the prohibition of things, keeping the Sabbath, no alcohol, no entertainment, or dressing a certain way, those prohibitions, they are like rungs on a ladder whereby we think that if we do them, we somehow make ourselves more acceptable to God. He goes, that's from the pit of hell. It, now the, the temptation to this is it kind of helps us know where we are. You know, Christianity, you don't get a report card every quarter. How am I doing? And, and, and yet, if I can rate my spirituality by what I am denying myself of, these physical pleasures, then maybe I can see how I'm doing. I can at least see how I'm doing with other people because they're not doing it, so I must be better than they are. What it is is it becomes a self-salvation project. You no longer rest in the grace of God through the mercy of Christ, but you're now resting in what you are doing or not doing as a means of finding acceptance with God. And that's why it comes out of the pit of hell, because it moves Jesus to the side, and you are at the center. So, so don't be tempted to, to fall into that. And then last, don't miss the value of the church leadership. You know, there's no imperatives in the first five verses. But in 6 and 7, Paul tells Timothy, teach the people these things. It's the church leadership, not, not exclusively that, because we need to do it with each other. But it's the responsibility of the leadership to make sure and hold the gospel up pure, right, and balanced, not moving into false teaching. Carl Truman wrote an article. I quoted a piece of it a number of months back on the, the title of the uh, article. is kind of cheeky. It's the gospel's not sufficient. And he says these words. He says, Paul sees that a church structure as well as a church message is vital to the safeguarding and propagation of the gospel. For Paul, the gospel is not in itself sufficient to ensure the continuation of the gospel. It needs men to preach it. It needs men, women, and children to tell it to their friends. And because all these agents are fallen, it needs a church structure to help safeguard its content. Uh, so the winds of false teaching will always be coming against this church, whether it's humanism, secularism, or whatever ism comes our way. And how do we navigate that, holding up the, the true gospel? So that's the first, that's the, what Paul's saying is be diagnosing deception. Be aware of false teaching. Anything that begins to move us away from the gospel of grace to a gospel of works is from the pit of hell. But notice the second thing he says in terms of fighting false teaching. He says, delight yourself in God. Be happy. Uh, the antidote to deception is gratitude for God. Look with me at 4 and 5. He says, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, for it's made holy by the word of God and prayer. And this is interesting few little verses here. Y you have this idea that, that the church's teaching or the leadership of the church is to teach not just the historical details of the faith. It's not just to say, hey, this is Christ dead, buried, and, and, and raised from life. That is true. That's the gospel. We teach that. Uh, but part of the teaching of the church is teaching how to live and how to walk in this life with the implications of the gospel. I mean, the idea is he's telling us to be happy in the things of God. He's instructing, when you have food, enjoy it. Notice that he says that at the end of verse 3. He says, God created food to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. If you believe in the truth of God as creator of all things, then you know food is good because he made it good. You hear the echo, don't you, in Genesis 1.31, when he says that everything he saw was good. So if God has declared food good, then food is good. But it's more than food that is good. It's also marriage. It's our sexuality. 
Notice in verse 4, he says, everything. He kind of expands the principle. He says, everything created by God is good. Everything. Our marriages. And that means our bodies. I mean, the bodies that we have, you may want to be taller, you may want to be thinner, you may want to be smarter. The reality is that God has knit you together in his womb. So we even have an understanding of our own bodies in this. It's good. Even our genders are good. Our maleness, our female, no one here determined what gender you would be born with. No, God gave you your gender, and it's good because God made you that way. In other words, we're to delight in all the things that God has created as good and to rejoice over those things. I think about the gift that he's given to us in Christ. Do we see the goodness that he has given to us in Christ? I mean, think about that. If you're here and you've, you've never considered Christ as the gift of God, it is the greatest gift of God to reconcile us to himself through faith. So so when you think about Paul says confronting false teaching, it's both by discerning what deception might be taking place in someone's teaching, but it's also in delighting all that God has made. So so what do you walk away with from here when you you look at this, these verses four and five? You're called to know and believe the truth. That's what he says at the end of three. And what that means is we're not just heresy hunters always trying to sniff out some deception in someone's teaching. Uh, We do want to learn How do I relate to the things of this world? The gifts that God has given to me, whether it be a job, a spouse, food, a body, all the things that God has, how do I relate to those things rightly? And and the way we do this is, of course, to understand uh, the nature of God, the goodness of God. He's given these things to us. Can I rejoice and be happy in them? Even the difficulties that he may bring to us in life, can we rejoice and know that he's sovereign over those things? We don't want to make too much of them. We don't want to overlove them, but we don't want to underlove them. We surely don't want to call what he calls good evil. You know, Augustine spoke about these, uh, one of the church fathers in the fourth century, and you've heard me speak about him before. He warns about an inordinate love. When you love something too much, or at least you love something more than the value of the object of your love. He said these words, he says, living a just and holy life requires us to be capable of an objective and impartial evaluation of things. He says to love things, that is to say, in the right order, so that you do not love what is not to be loved or fail to love what is to be loved or have a greater love for something that should be loved less. In other words, our love needs to be commensurate with the value of the object. And this we know by by God. We want to love our kids, but we don't want to love our children more than we love God. We want to love our job, but we don't want to love our jobs more than we love our families. We, We want to make sure and have a right love for things. We want to know and believe the truth that God has made these things. We rejoice in them. But secondly, we want to receive with thanksgiving what God has given to us. We want to receive the gift of marriage. If you're married... You know, God instituted the first marriage. Let me just pray for these folks. Lord, we thank you for them and their service that they render. Would you grant them mercy in all their care? And may the people being cared see your mercy behind them. And may they thank you for that. We pray this in the name of Jesus. So you have marriage. Marriage, God ordained marriage. He instituted the first marriage. He presided over the first marriage. He made marriage to be a picture of the triune God. The differences between male and female, and yet they complement one another. There's equality, and yet there's diversity. So our marriages are to be reflective. Are we thankful for those? I mean, are we happy? You know, I think about what the, you know, centuries of negativism regarding marriage that came from the church, that marriage was only for procreation. And marriage wasn't seemed, that's what the Puritans did. If the Puritans did anything, they did a lot of things. Well, one was to lift marriage up and say marriage is not simply for the perpetuity of humanity, but was for our pleasure, for our happiness, companionship. We have a close friend in marriage. We're to be thankful for that, to be happy over the nature of marriage. Not just at our anniversary, but all the time. To be grateful that God has brought us one. Now, I recognize some of us, 
are in troubled marriages or difficult marriages, or you want to be in one and you're not, or you've lost a spouse. I, I, there is a lot of sorrow and sadness and hardship attending. And this ought to, even that, even that desire for that kind of thankfulness, let it drive you to God that you might lament before him. You might ask for him to be to you a strong father, aiding you, strengthening you. But we don't want to see that marriage is, is not a blessing of God. Uh, or food, food, for example. We're to be thankful for food. I mean, think about food. God created the male and female, and he put them in what? Big old garden, a lot of food. You know, how about the food that was used to memorialize, you know, the exodus of Egypt? He uses food as a picture to show deliverance. He uses food to memorialize the atoning work of Jesus Christ, the bread and the wine, the last day, the banquet on the last day will be with food. We're to love food, enjoy food, to thank him for it, not to see it as something where you can't have that, you can't have that. Now, you know, I'm a self-confessed, I like food. I like spices. I like spices and sauces and all kinds of savory dishes. I love that. Now, we don't want to go overboard. We don't overlove food. We overlove food. We, we make too much of it. We think about it. You know, we begin to, it's not just gluttony, it's not just quantity here, but it's also quality. We can be over-concerned in the nature of food. You know, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, spoke about the nature of a culture. You know, he says it's one thing, you can attract a crowd uh, with a strip tease. He goes, but what happens when a, when a crowd can be attracted over food? Let me tell you what he says. He says, suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate onto stage and slowly lifting the cover to let everyone see, just before the lights went out, that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone wrong with the appetite for food? We, we want to watch it, the good things of God. We want to love them ordinately. We want to love them appropriately. So how do you do this? Well, notice what he says here. It's to be, it's to be made holy by the word of God and prayer. Now this, made holy by the word of God and prayer. This is a foundation for our custom of saying grace before meals, right? We, we kind of give a word of grace. And what we, all end, up, what we end up doing is we, end up, we kind of bless the food, right? We say a blessing over the food. If I might, could I challenge that practice? And instead of blessing the food, the food is already good, right? We don't need to have some kind of a spiritual prayer making the food what it's not. No, God created it. It's already good. Let's bless the Lord for the food. I think that's the tradition of history is we bless God who has given to us rich fare that we can enjoy and will strengthen our bodies. That to make holy by the word of God and prayer, we're not sanctifying it, making it something that's different. What we're doing is we are setting it apart as a gift of God to us. And so we begin to thank him for it. But may I encourage you to go beyond just food. Uh, we can say grace before, before going to work. We can say grace before being with a good close friend. In fact, G.K. Chesterton, this Catholic apologist, said these words. He says, you say grace before meals. All right. I say grace before the concert, and before the opera. I say grace before the play and the pantomime. I say grace before I open a book and grace before sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing. I say grace before I dip the pen in the ink. What he's saying here is that all the things that God has given to us, not just food and marriage, those are the two examples in our text. All the things that God has given to us are good, and we are to thank him for it. That's why Paul says, whatever you do, whatever you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. It, does this mark your life? Is there a gratitude and a thankfulness? Not so much a worried about this, this, and this. Christianity can tend to be more about prohibitions than they are about promoting the greatness of God in the things that we've given to him. Can we seek this week maybe to move to be more grateful, to be more thankful, uh, to look at these things that we have. It may be your job. It may be your spouse. It may be your home. It may be the children you have. It may be the opportunity. May, can you look at those things as specifically given to you by God so that he would display his goodness and mercy, promoting in you a faith in him, 
rather than seeing God as someone who is always watching us to see if we're having too much fun, that we might actually see God as the giver of these things. And we might thank him for it. So, so two things when we confront false teaching. We do want to discern the truth. We want to discern where the falsehood is in a teaching. But at the same time, we want to delight. So uh, let's take a moment and just ask God for grace to help these words maybe land in the soft soil of our souls. It might bear fruit. And then I'll pray for us. Father, I do want to be thankful to you for this church that we've gathered here to hear your word. We, we desire to be different. We, we want to be changed. We, we want to be grateful. Father, we can, I confess that we can often just look at what we don't have or we question your goodness when things don't go our way. Uh, we often are willing to believe in a lie if it advances what we already want to do. Father, we confess that. You know our souls, that everything is open before you, and we want to be even right now. And so, Father, would you uh, give to us your spirit that you would fill us? Or would you tell us that if, though we are evil, we still know how to give good gifts to our children? We do. If our children ask for bread, we don't give them a stone. If they ask for fish, we don't give them a snake. And how much more will you give the spirit to those who ask? So I ask that you would bring conviction upon the hearts of people that perhaps need that admonishment, but for those that are hurting and suffering, that you would bring comfort and a peace and a love. Uh, Father, use us in each other's life that we might encourage this kind of gratitude, thankfulness, receiving all things with thanksgiving. Know that everything you've made, your sovereign purposes for us will be good. May we have the grace to walk in gratitude before them. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.